<laughs> because the sun's <laughs> shining right on my camera. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Don Newman. I'm one of the admin team of the group, um, and we have three other admin team members. That's Abby Bates, who is also the founder of the group, uh, Dana oh. Carey, and Monica Harrell. And of course, we have Peter Lilliadal with us. Um, first off, uh, thank you again so much for your time, Peter. Um, it's great that you're, you're willing to do this uh, for a second time. No, oh, my pleasure. I always have time for this group. That's good. We didn't scare you away the first time, I guess. No, no, not at all. <laughs> Um, all right, so uh, we, we have a, a, a series of topics we want to talk about um, based primarily on the poll that we put up on the Facebook group. Um, so I think uh, Monica has first, the first question. Yeah, so the first topic we wanted to ask you about was consolidation. Should teachers, I guess, how to be more effective? Should they have a plan going into while looking at students' work? Or what's the best way that teachers can be effective at that? Okay, so first of all, the, this is this is going to be a perennial question. And why? Because in my opinion, and I think I mentioned this last time, consolidation is the practice that is the most challenging of any of the practices uh, in the thinking classroom uh, toolkit. And the reason is because so many things have to happen at once, right? Um, in order to be to do a good consolidation, you have to be, uh, selecting, sequencing, and seed, seeding, S-E-E-D-I-N-G. And the, obviously selecting comes before sequencing, but seeding actually starts way early. So the way this is, is okay. So selecting is as the kids are working at the whiteboards and they're, they're busy doing whatever you're doing to try to maintain flow, um, they're really anxious to erase things to get more space sometimes. And when you see things that are is really good and you want to be still there for the consolidation, you have to kind of lock it in. And that's where you draw the box around it with a red marker and say, please don't erase that. Uh, so that's a selecting. Now you're gonna select way more than you're gonna use in the gallery walk. Then comes the sequencing. The sequencing is how just before you're getting ready to consolidate, you look at all the things that have been selected and now you pick which ones you wanna visit and the order you wanna visit them in. Seeding is if something isn't appearing that you really want to be there for the consolidation, you may wanna plant a little seed with some groups, right? So for example, um, Everyone's got a table of values, but no one's drawing a graph. And you really want a graph. So then you, you go to a group and you say, nice table of values. What do we normally do with those? And they say, well, we draw a graph. So you say, great idea. Why don't you do that? And as soon as they've done it, you draw a box around and say, don't erase that. Um, so this seeding thing is when things are not coming out that you were hoping to see. The problem is that some seeds take really easily and some are hard to grow. Graphing is one of them. Like a grade eight student would rather chew off their arm than draw a graph. So like you may have to plant that seed multiple times in multiple locations and keep coming back and watering it in order to just get one of them to grow. Um, others are just like, wait, have you thought about this representation? And they're like, wow, I love that. And then they're just off and running. So consolidation is tricky because you're trying to do all these things while you're also trying to keep the flow going. So what are some things that you can do to make this easier? Well, one thing we've been playing with is we, we, we set up the consolidation before the lesson starts. So you kind of make a list of the three to five things you want to see appear in consolidation, and you've already sequenced it. And you have this list, and as it's happening, you walk around and go, oh, I like that, don't erase that, draw a box around it. You're gonna immediately put a number three on it because you know it's number three because you have it on your list already. And then you keep doing that. And if number four is not appearing anywhere, then you start planting seeds for this. So it's sort of like we plan for the consolidation before the lesson even begins. Now, there are benefits of that, which is that you're not having to try to do all this on the fly. The drawback is that you don't leave enough room for spontaneous things to occur. So just be aware that every class will always produce solutions that you have not anticipated. 
And it's okay if you have your list of one to three things that you want to see in the consolidation, because you can always put in a 2.5 or a, a 1.7 or whatever it is you need in your sequencing. If something appears that you would like to share that wasn't expected, or maybe it's just that there was a group who did something that was a little unusual, but they worked really hard and you want to honor that. So then you, you put them into the sequence. The other thing is, there is a huge difference between being present in the lesson and listening to the students and working with what they're producing and being and feeling like that sheepdog who's trying to funnel all the sheep to through a really narrow gate. So one of the drawbacks, and you have to really check yourself for that, is just because you have a plan that you want to see emerge, you still have to be present and you have to work with what's in the room. And I think any teacher who's ever taught the same lesson multiple times in the same day, especially in a thinking classroom setting, has experienced this where like the first lesson, they were coming up with all this stuff and you're like, oh, I can't wait to see that appear in the second lesson. And then it's not appearing in the second lesson. And then you're pushing, you're pushing, you're pushing. And then you realize that the, the kids are starting to look at you and say things like, is this what you mean? Is this what you want? And then you realize you're pushing too hard. So there has to be always always a balance between what is actually emerging and what is emerging a bowl and what is it that you were hoping to emerge but you're going to have to do all the work to get it to happen right so just be present that doesn't mean you can't plan but always always be present does that answer the question yes i think it does there, yeah. there's one other thing i want to say about consolidation is that Sometimes you're going to be in the room, you're going to feel like, we don't need to do a consolidation here. I have visited every group. They're all doing it. They know how to solve two-step equations. They're, they're nailing it. They're hitting it out of the park. And if I did a consolidation, in the, like one of the things that happens, you always know when you've done a consolidation that you didn't need to do when you get when you go to the first board and you say, can someone not in this group tell me what this group is thinking and no one says anything. And they're all staring at you because what you wanting them to say is so obvious that they think that that can't be what you're looking for. And, and what that means is that consolidation wasn't really needed, at least not on that level, because everybody in the room is, is thinking this is too obvious. There must be something else. Yeah, that's a good nugget. Well, I think Abigail has the next question. Yes, so um, another topic that come, has come up a lot lately, I feel like over the summer has been about notes and note taking. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe you have um, also some new things that have come up in your research recently about notes. So we'd love to hear that. And also just any general tips that you have um, for helping students to develop their own note taking um, for their future selves. Right. So, uh, yeah. So uh, let's back up a little bit here. So in my research, we look closely at what, what I write, you write notes look like and what fill in the blank notes look like. And, and like the research has clearly showed that this is a tremendous waste of time. Like the students are completely disengaged. They're just producing things in writing in their notebook that, that they're not even thinking about. And it just wasn't worth it. Now that's, of course, that's, that's more true if you're teaching a group of grade eights and less true if you're teaching the honors pre-calculus kids who are, they're just hanging on every word in there, right? But it's it, the demographic shifts. Um, but even those kids in the honors pre-calculus class, they are, if they're not fully engaged in the note-making process, then, then they're not getting out of it what, what they potentially can. So, so we started on this journey. Okay, that's not working. What can we do instead? So we shifted the discourse from note-taking to note-making. And we played with a whole bunch of different things. And I outlined those in the, in the, in the book. And, and then it was time to, you know, send the book to print. And the book went to print. And I didn't stop working on it because... Uh, although what we found was better, I didn't feel like it provided enough, enough support for students who were struggling, right? So we, I kept working at it, I kept working at it, I kept working at it. Um, the big 
transition happened about 18 months ago for me, maybe a little less than that, was, was when I was really looking at these templates and I realized that we're not spending enough time with worked examples. And then I started playing with worked examples and I started to realize that worked examples actually is a really good structure around which students can build their note making. So <clears throat> I went into a, into a different approach to it, which was what would note making look like if we did it through the lens of, of worked examples and played with a whole bunch of different things in a bunch of different classrooms. And what's emerged is sort of a five step plan. I don't have slides to show you on this, but I, I'm just going to talk you through it. It's pretty fresh. And, and like I said, I do not have the depth of data on this, but it's showing to be very promising. So step one was the key piece. And we actually had all the steps in place except step one, and it wasn't still wasn't working perfectly. And then step one came along. So this is step one. Step one, we give kids a piece of paper just eight and a half by 11. It's split down the middle. On the left side of the page is a title, three bullet points that are already filled in with notes, and then a fully worked example. So there's a question and then a line by line worked example. And you got little thought bubbles and clouds and you got, you got arrows and all the things you, you would like to say inside of a worked example that that sort of goes beyond just the mathematics like line by line but sort of like little talking points and see the connection here and, and these little things right so it's fully worked so the half half the page has that title three bullet points with conceptual notes next to it and then a fully worked example so the question fully worked example except there are two errors on the page one error is in the bullet points and the other error is in the worked example. So now the kids have to find the errors. Uh, they can work together on that. They find the errors. And then on the right side of the page, they now make the correct worked example. So they have the corrected three bullet points. They have the, the same question but now their fully worked example version of that question. And again, adding in thought bubbles and stuff like that. And they can be the exact same thought bubbles that were on the left-hand side, right? Like, um, and this turned out to be really, really effective in helping students see what, what information a, a worked example can carry, but also providing sort of a template of what it can look like, right? So we had this sort of both form and function wrapped into one. And we were using this, we've used this even with kids as young as grade one. Now we take out the bullet points, but, but even kids at, as young as grade one can do this. It works as a really nice kickstart. All right, that's step one. And you stay with step one as long as you feel it's necessary to get the kids to become proficient at this. But step one, we also have to recognize, is insufficient. So then we move to stage two. Now, stage two, we, we provide the title. Um, we provide space for the three bullet points, and we provide the question. But they have to fill in the bullet points. We may actually initiate the bullet points with some triggers, but we provide the question for which they provide the worked example. So now we've taken away that template, but they should have learned it by now. Now they can create that worked example. Um, and step two is, is really where we want students to, to be able to get to, where they, can, um, where they can actually think deeply about what is it that we want students to capture in a worked example and using the worked example as the vehicle through which they communicate their understanding and their thinking and their process, right? Think of it as a frame. All right, <clears throat> now we move to step three. Step three, exactly the same as step two, except we provide three questions for them to turn into worked example. They have to choose 
they have to choose which one they want to use. Right. And in the initial stages of stage three, it doesn't matter which one they choose. It really doesn't matter. But as we get deeper into stage three, it starts to matter. It starts to matter which one you're choosing. So now they're starting to get metacognitive about it's not just how we represent the thinking around the work example. It's also around the idea that the question we're picking makes a difference. Then we move to step four. Step four is nothing. They just, they pick the worked example. They can pick it from anything they did at the whiteboards that day. They can make up their own. It doesn't matter. They're picking it, right? And they're deciding what bullet points they want to write about it. And they're deciding which, which, which thought bubbles to put in. So it's, it's really quite open. And we were thought we were we thought we were done with step four, and then we realized that that was pretty good. Step four actually is is if we can get our grade eights and nines to step four, we're we're good, we're good. But it turns out it's insufficient for the older students. Um, we needed a step five, and step five comes in two parts. Um, there's a five A and a five B. Five A. We provide the example, the question around which they will build their worked example. But then after they've built the worked example, they have to argue, they have to explain why that example is insufficient. Why that worked example does not carry all of the knowledge that they want to communicate to themselves through worked examples. And then they pick a second worked example that will carry the remainder of the information. So I think we can think about this in math in lots of different ways, but you know that one example, like it cannot carry, it cannot carry the burden of all knowledge uh, on a concept because there's nuance and there's complexity that exists in, in the variance that we see in the mathematics. Um, 5B is, we again don't give anything. They pick one example, then they explain why that one example is insufficient, then they do a second one. And then if they need to do a third one, again, they explain why it's insufficient, they do a third one. And this is the highest level of metacognition. And we really need to get our senior students to that level where they are recognizing that and a worked example can carry a lot of information, but it can't carry all the information. We need more than one worked example and selectivity is important. And we started to see selectivity in, in, in number three, in step three, and we saw it in step four and so on. So it's very scaffolded. And those three bullet points can become more than three bullet points. And we can also merge these with these ideas with the templates that are in the book. But that's sort of the newest phase we're at. We're finding that Kids are much more successful at making notes when it, it's built around an example because that's what they're doing at the whiteboards is that they're, 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 they're doing mathematics. And this is much more closely aligned with that as opposed to that sort of step back and, and reflect on what, you, what did you learn and how can you put that into notation and so on. So maintaining this idea of worked example, but they're creating a worked example. Step one gives them the template for being able to do that. So yeah. we've had some questions come up in the chat. Uh, yes. Dana and Monica are helping monitor the chat. So thanks, ladies. Um, so one of them was about like, how long should this process take? And so I don't know if I, I'm guessing they mean in comparison to when right. they were doing notes before, right. short right. end of the session. Yeah. Oh, like how long should it take within the lesson or how long should it take to get I, through the whole sequence? Do you want to add in, Dana? You saw that question. Did they mention specifically? I think they mean from step one to step five. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So don't, don't, don't think of it like that in the sense of like some of your students are never going to get to step five. Like that's not the goal, right? Like if you're teaching kindergarten or grade one or grade two, maybe step, step one is sufficient, right? If we're teaching grade sixes, we want to maybe get them up to step two. If we're teaching our grade eights and nines, we want to get them to step three, right? Ten, step four, or we want our 11s and 12s to get to step five. Um, so the one thing that's important is it doesn't matter how old the students are, you got to start at step one, right? And, and this was something that revealed itself in the research over and over and over again, not just on notes, but on everything. Now, just because they're older doesn't mean they're better at it if they haven't had the experiences prior. So 
I don't know enough to know how it will, how long it will take. I can tell you that we've played with it enough to know that we can get students to step five. Um, how long will the process take? I don't know. But in the meantime, you can think of step, if, you, if you're dealing with a concept, let's say you're working in grade 10 and you're dealing with a concept where you need the students to do more than one example, but you're still at step two. Well, you can do step two three times within the same lesson. You can say, I want you to do a note, a, a worked example for this question, a worked example for this question, and a worked example for this question, right? Like you can, you can do that. When you get to step three, you can still set it up in three different ways. You can say, I want you to select one from these three and then select another one from these three and select another one from these three. Like if you need them to do multiple examples and you haven't yet gotten them to step five, you can still just repeat step one or two or three multiple times within a note making session. So you're not gonna, you don't have to sit there and go, oh, I wish I got to step five because they really need to have multiple examples on this topic, right? Like you don't need to do that. Um, you can just run it multiple times. So I don't know. I don't know the answer to that because it's so new, but it's exciting. And I can tell you that it's been met with a lot of success. Do you have any, um... Maybe like clarification too about how worked examples are differing from traditional mimicking of notes. That was another question that came up. Right. So mimicking of so so we go traditional note taking. The students are just copying what you write. You write on the board, they copy it on the board. And there is there's for eighty percent of the students, there's absolutely no thought process that goes into this after the first five minutes. Right. They're just completely tuned out. They're now just recreating the picture that you're creating on the board without really a lot of thought on how line seven is connected to line eight and so on and so forth. That's what note taking is. In a note making space, they're not copying anything. All right. Um, they're having to be to be cognitively present and critical the entire time. Even in the step one phase where they're they have to be critical of what's in front of them and find the error. And then they have to be able to recreate the notes, but they're gonna to have to be present and cognizant because let's say the error appeared in line two. Well, lines three through six are gonna be completely different from what's on the left-hand side, right? They have that as a template to follow from for form purposes, but they're gonna to have to create the mathematics. They're gonna to have to be present in that sense. And Thank that's the key. Like that's, that's I think this is really the key. If like I'm not saying this is going to be the end all be all either, but but I think that if we can just get the students to be present in the note making experience, we're going to achieve much more than if we if they're just mindlessly copying. Yeah, thanks for sharing all that. It's very exciting to hear and gives me already like I'm sure everybody's brains are already going with new ideas that they want to try out. Mm -hmm. Um Dana has the next question for us. Um, in addition to lots of questions about note taking, we see a lot of things come across about the check your understanding. Um, things from, you know, how often or how does that really replace homework? Um, but tell us what you're finding out about the check your understanding. So we've been, that's the other place we've been playing. Um, this one actually has a ton of flexibility, right? Check your understanding questions. And I think it has one of, it's one of the practices that has the most room for a teacher to just kind of step in and say, it feels like we need to do some check your understanding questions. And I've been in classrooms where a teacher comes in and says, okay, listen, you know what? We've been at the boards for four days straight. I think today we're just doing check your understanding questions. Here's a bunch of questions. And then, you know, work with, work any way you want. And then some will, pair up, some will head to whiteboard, some will, will, will work by themselves. One of the things we find in the check your understanding space over and over and over again is when students choose to work together, whether that's a, whether that comes at the end of a lesson and they're just working with their elbow partners or whatever, the, the mode of engagement, the way they're engaging with the other person is in, in, in a fashion that we call alone together. So they're working on their own, together with the person sitting next to them. So it's not like what's happening at the whiteboards where they're doing it collectively. 
they're clearly doing it on their own, but they're doing it in concert with the people around them and they're tapping into that resource as necessary. It's really fascinating to see that this idea of alone together. Now, so how much and so on and so forth, I, you know, you really just got to feel it, right? Like if the kids are, are, are really rocking it at the whiteboards that day, maybe just leave them at the whiteboards. And then the next day you shorten up how much whiteboard work there is and then get them into check your note making and check your understanding questions. Um, we also found that um, there's one other little nuance that we've played with that's making a huge difference. So I was in a classroom just before the summer break. Uh, it was a grade, I wanna say it was a grade eight classroom we were doing Pythagorean, Pythagoras and we got them into their seats for the last 10 minutes and um, I said okay I'm going to put some check your understanding questions on the board and I wrote them in three columns and I said to the teacher I said watch this and I wrote mild medium spicy above the three columns so three columns of questions three to four questions in each column and I labeled the columns mild, medium, and spicy. And then, I, and then we just watched what happened. And holy cow. And we had like 12 teachers observing. So, but the kids were, they were like, whoo, I think I'm going to do one mild, one medium, and then I'm going straight to spicy. Other kids are going, we only have 10, main, 10 minutes left. I think I'm just going to have to go for spicy. And it was just fascinating watching how the kids we're digging into this idea of, of wanting to, to challenge themselves simply because we had put the headings mild, medium, and spicy on there. Um, it makes a difference. And this is, this is the thing that keeps coming up in the research over and over and over again. These small things, these small inconsequential things make huge differences, right? I was in a grade five class in, uh, I think it was March, and I put some questions up on the board. I didn't even label them. I just put three questions on the board. And I said, here's some check your understanding questions. And then the kids are like, can we have one more? And the teachers who are observing are like, who are these kids? What, who are they? they we have to fight to get them to do homework. And here they are asking, and I'm like, okay, here's another one. And they're like, can we have one more? And I'm like, okay, but this is it. This is the last one. And they were just so excited to want to be doing this. And it's, it's, I know a huge part of it is because we're positioning it as something that's inside the classroom. We're also giving the students autonomy around that. And we know that self-determination theory says that when students or when people have a sense of autonomy and a sense of purpose, that they are much more invested in something. And part of it is that it's not something that we're just saying, here's do questions one through seven odd at home. Where, where everybody, it just feels to the students like, nobody really cares about this, right? Like this is, this is just something that's been thrown out as an afterthought. This is, the teacher's giving us some class time to this. They're letting us choose who we wanna work with. They're letting us choose how we wanna work. They're letting us choose which questions to do. And all of us, and this is also happening on the heels of having had success in the lesson. So there's just a lot of optimism around this. Now, there's just so much variety that we can do with this. You can still have questions that go home. You can still have questions for review. You can still come in on a day and say, I think we're doing check your understanding questions all day. Or we could come, we could come in and we could say, okay, well, here's, here's columns of questions and the questions can include questions from previous concepts. It doesn't have to be something that's just from today. Just having that autonomy to tap into the expertise that's in the room is, is uplifting for these kids. And it, it's different than what we see around the homework discourse. Does that help, Dana? It does. Um, one of the other parts of the Czechia understanding that, that I often see asked about is, um, you know, one of the components is providing the answer, mm -hmm. not the work, but just the, the final answer. So have you seen anything, process that seems to work best, like giving them those answers with the questions or delaying those answers? How, how does that seem to work out best? 
So first of all, one of the things we're learning is you don't, you need to have a feedback loop that it doesn't have to be answers. You could be the feedback loop as well, right? So where you're checking in with the kids and they're, they're, they're moving on, right? So this is one of the places where we can answer questions and let students know that they're doing well, but there has to be a feedback loop, right? Like check your understanding. You have to know if you understand, right? You have to, so there has to be a feedback loop. If you're gonna provide the answers, we've played with lots of different things. Um, I can't say that any one of them is better than the other, although I will say that providing the solution is better than providing a whole worked solution, right? Just here's the number answer. Um, a couple of teachers I work with provide an answer sheet that has, if there's 10 check your understanding questions, the answer sheet has 20 answers on it. And they're not in order. But, you know, if the student's looking at, they have an answer of 17.34 and they're looking at the answer sheet and there is a 17.34, they, they feel pretty confident that they got the right answer, right? And you don't have to play games. It's not about trickery. It's not about any of this stuff. It's not about trying to find distractors or, or having two questions that have the same answer. It's not about that at all. It's just about that sort of sense that I've done the work I found an answer that matches. I feel confident that this work is correct, so I can move on. Is there a situation where we would want to provide them the worked solution, like the whole, not just the answer? Yeah, I think that's like for younger kids, they don't really care that much, but for the older kids, absolutely. You can just put a 24 hour hold on that, right? So before they come to class the next day, you could release that, or at the end of the next class, you can release that. But there's absolutely value in that. More information is better, but release it in such a way that they actually have to choose to go and get it, right? So you post it online somewhere, and then, and then it it has more meaning to them that they're that they're they're choosing that this is important enough for me to go and look it up to see if I did it correctly. Great, thank you. I, I think that hit some of the questions that were popping up in our, our Facebook yeah. feed also. But, uh, but feel free to play with this, right? right. Use your own judgment, but, but just understand this. Be purposeful, really be purposeful, right? Like, like with the note making, the goal is to have the student be present, right? Um, whereas, and with the check your understanding questions, the goal is to have them engage and be reflective and be metacognitive and, and be when they're working on it. So play with it and just, just keep that in mind. What is the central goal here, right? And if it feels like, okay, we've been at the whiteboards for a while, let's do some check your understanding questions. Let's, let's start to work on that transition from collective knowing and doing to individual knowing and doing. As long as you're being purposeful about that, I think that's okay. It's, it's when you just start throwing it out for the sake of doing it that then it's starting to lose some of its of its meaning right be purposeful right thank you so much and um, that was a lot of clarification is them for me um, oh, so I, I appreciate that um our next part has to do with assessment and don has the questions on that um so you know now we're moving to sort of the last um the last of the 14 practices and that is um you know, we're, if we're doing the standard-based grading and we have rubrics, we need to assess the kids. Um, and we need to provide, I think, a lot of opportunities for the kids to show that they've mastered the material, mm -hmm. right? So obviously one source of that is assessments, quizzes, tests, that kind of thing. Um, the, the question that becomes over and above those, um, you know, where are those opportunities? Um, and if they're observational during the class, um, you know, that presents a couple of issues, one of which you spoke about last time, which is just managing all that data. Um, and the other is you also spoke last time about, um, you know, the students have partial knowledge when they're finished the group work, which is why they can do so well as a group. Um, and then when they sit down and do it individually, it, it doesn't always work out that way. And if you, if you're seeking out data while they're working in class, you know, is that really, are they really showing what they can do at that point? Or is it, you know, are they getting, is it, is it, is that really more than they, than, than they, than they know? Okay, wow, all right, lots of questions here. Um, the first thing to know is 
you know, tests and quizzes are still an incredibly efficient means to gather lots of data on lots of students at the same time. Um, and when we shift in that chapter 14, that standards or outcomes based assessment, it's it, that doesn't change. We still have quizzes, we still have tests, but, but again, let's be really thoughtful about this. It's not just a bunch of questions. It's like, what outcome and to what depth are we probing that outcome with this question, right? Let's be deliberate about that. Um, but then when we, what we make use of when we, when we harvest data from that is that we're not aggregating it together and saying you got 17 out of 24 on this quiz. We're, we're pulling out and saying, well, on this outcome, you demonstrated this and on this outcome, you demonstrated that and so on. And, and then when we give that test paper back, we have to not aggregate. We cannot put a 17 out of 24 on it because then the students, that's, they're not shifting their mindset to understand that this is a collection of opportunities to demonstrate mastery on different outcomes, as opposed to an event, which is on this event, I got 17 out of 24. So we have to be purposeful again. Um, but then the question is, what do we do above and beyond that? And, and, and one of the things that's really, really important, and I think we did talk about this last time, is I always say you wanna be a hunter, not a gatherer, because there are so many opportunities to gather evidence in a thinking classroom. It's constant, whether it's from students working in groups at the whiteboards, and I know there's a caveat to that, and I'll get to that in a minute, to them, a student working individually on check your understanding questions, to just a conversation you're having with a student, um, there's just endless, endless opportunities. And if we go into that space thinking, well, let's just see what the data brings me today, we're gonna drown. We're gonna drown in that. We're not gonna be able to keep up with the record keeping. It's gonna be overwhelming. Um, we, have to be, we have to be a hunter, not a gatherer. So being a hunter means I'm going out today because I've been looking at the data I have on Don. And although Don has shown me some things, there are some things that he has yet to show me. Um, I need to go and take a look at what he's capable of today. And I'm gonna observe him in groups and I'm gonna see what he's able to do in the groups. I might hand him the marker. I might ask a pointed question. I might ask him to explain what he's seeing at the board. I might, uh, when he's doing your check your, his check your understanding questions, sit down and have a conversation with him as he's working on one of the questions, right? Like there's so many opportunities, but I'm, I'm, I'm going into that lesson deciding that I wanna, I wanna get some data on Dylan. Meanwhile, with Abigail, I don't need to get any data. And Abigail has shown me everything I need to know, right? Like she's shown me everything through her tests and quizzes that, yeah, she's, she's, she's got it all. I can ignore that. And that frees up time to then really focus in on the dons in my classroom and so on and so forth, right? So when we, when we think about this, one of the problems that has come from this sort of events-based or point gathering system that we've all grown up in and that we've all been expected to maintain for so many decades is that we have this, we've been lulled into a feeling of synchronicity and equality. Uh, this idea that everyone has to be tested at the same time and everyone has to have all of the same exact same opportunities to demonstrate their learning. And that is, that is a really hard thing to shake when we're trying to move our way into these other forms of assessment. But it doesn't all have to be on the same day. I may be looking at Dawn on Tuesday and I'm looking at Monica on Thursday, right? And they're, you, they're doing different things on those days, but there's still opportunities for them to demonstrate learning in different outcomes. So this idea of synchronicity is we really have to let go of that. And primary teachers know this already. Like they have no problem with that idea. They know what it means to assess students on uh, individual students at different times. And then the other thing is this idea of equality, which means that, well, is it really fair to Abigail if, if, I, if I'm giving Don multiple opportunities to demonstrate his learning? Of course it's fair to Abigail, as long as she has had whatever opportunities are necessary for her to demonstrate her learning, right? So it's, it's, it's about this idea of multiple opportunities for all our students, but not all our students are gonna need as many opportunities as others. So, so we have, to, we have to just check those sorts of 
cultural hangups that we have that are as a result of, of the types of assessment paradigms that we've had to work in for all these decades. Um, now let's get back to that one really pointed question, which part of the question, which was this idea of that collective knowing and doing is not always reflective of individual knowing and doing. So when I'm having a conversation with Don when he's in his group, is that really a true reflection of what he'd be able to do individually later on? And often it's not. Sometimes it is. And it is the degree to which I actually tailor the question specifically at Don are, are really, really telling in this regard. So for example, if I'm circling something and I say, Don, can you explain what's going on here? That's very different from standing back and watching Don, Don as part of his cohort of three produce a correct solution on something, right? That's a very different question. Um, because in that second latter example, he's caught up in that momentum. There's a collective synergy that's going on, that collective knowing and doing everyone filling in each other's gaps in, in both verbal and nonverbal ways. And it's really, really a measure of collective efficacy. Whereas me going off script and pointing at something and asking a very targeted question is quite revealing uh, of an individual's ability. But at the same time, I'm going to make the recording. Right. If I'm having a conversation, I'm going to record it as a chat conversation. But if I'm standing back and watching him do it as part of a group, I'm going to put it as a G. And then when it's time to analyze the data before reporting, I know what that G means. That G means he did it as part of that collective efficacy. I'm not 100 percent sure if that G on its own represents what Don is able to do on his own. But that's followed up by two check marks. And it's like, OK, well, I got pretty good back up here saying that that day that he did as part of a group, he really knew what he was doing because he then did it twice individually, right? So it's, so it's about looking, gathering the data, recording it with as much specificity as will allow you to be reflective on that data when it's the day of you having to produce a grade, but then looking at the data as a whole and asking yourself, what story does this tell, right? And if all it is is G's and X's, under one of the outcomes, I'm thinking, okay, well, that means that Don could do it in a group, but he can't do it individually. Maybe if I'm a primary teacher, my comment on the report card is that Don can do this with support, but is still struggling to do it independently. And then I have to make sense of that if it's a secondary classroom and how do I turn that into, a, into some sort of a grade. I don't know. What do you think, Don? Does that sort of address most of those questions, you think? Um, it does. Um, it, it does make things clear. The, the, I think that my specific, very specific question is the answer very well, right? Would ask, ask pointed questions to specific people. Yeah. On the, on the when else to do it. So, you know, you mentioned check your understanding if they're working on that. They don't, you know, the whole idea with check your understanding is it's their choice what to do. And um, yeah. you know, it's not graded typically, but no. That's not an issue if you do it that way. And number one, number two. No. Okay. Outside, so let me, outside of class times, if I have students. Absolutely. Class, that's okay come too. and see me at lunch. Um, and students will do that voluntarily too, especially the ones who are hungry to get good grades will come in and say, okay, look, I've been, <laughs> I've been working on this. Let me show you what I can do. Give me a chance. Right. And they come in after school. They come in at lunch. They come in during a spare, whatever. I think those are all highly, highly valuable. And in fact, this is actually what portfolio, sorry, portfolios were intended to be for. A portfolio is not me providing you with a menu of things I want to see in there. A portfolio is you as a student using it to showcase what you have learned that I have yet to find evidence of. And that's not to say that I'm going to mark the portfolio and say that that's it, you're done. It's going to be like a ticket in the door. Look, let me show you what I've been working on. Give me a chance to come in and, and show you after school that I can do this on my own now, right? Like, like that's what the portfolio is. It's this, it's this evidence that effort has been ongoing and learning has been happening. Now, the first question you asked there is, is it okay to look at them doing check your understanding questions, which isn't always marked? And this is where this dichotomy between formal and informal and formative and summative starts to cave in, right? Like even, 
let's say, let's talk about Abigail for a while. We haven't talked about her. You know, she's done all these test questions, all these summative questions. And I'm completely discard, discounting some of those questions that she has produced summatively because they've been overridden by other evidence from her summative assessments, right? So summative doesn't mean that anything that's collected in a formal fashion means it's going to make it into the grade. Likewise, things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis, which would normally fall under the informal or the formative aspect, might make it into the grade because I just happened to capture some evidence from there. So this idea of this, the, this dichotomy of formative and summative sort of falls apart in this, in this, in this, uh, in this space where I'm just looking for evidence and that evidence can come from lots of different sources. So yeah, it's totally valid. But then again, me watching you do a question and your check your understanding question, me making a record of it, doesn't mean it's gonna make it into the grade, right? It can be overridden by the next quiz or whatever, right? Like it's, it's just data and it's data from different sources. Um, I think Abby has a, a follow-up question uh, related to assessment. Okay. Yeah, so there's some questions coming up um, in the chat, and also I have some because I'm working on assessment this year <laughs> especially. Um, but we're kind of wondering, there's been a lot of questions about how do you weight your grade books, and I know on a lot of um, places in Canada, they do the triangulation that you mentioned in the assessment chapter, but it's kind of at the end in the Q&A section. Yeah. Um, but us in the US are maybe not as familiar. So I don't know if you'd mind expanding on that or um, maybe even sharing some examples of how you see people actually put the grades in, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay, so weighting comes in a couple of different shapes and sizes. So the first thing is we have to understand that grading and assessment is always weighted. Whether, and it, whether we're taking control of it or not, it's getting weighted, right? And it's weighted by a whole bunch of different things. In the traditional setting, we used to weight things by making this question worth seven. So if this question is worth, worth seven marks, and that would, that would increase the weight of it. But here's the irony. That definition question that was on the first page of the test, well, that definition question appeared on all three quizzes this unit, and it appeared on the test. And I got, it all of a sudden is actually the weightiest question data that I have in my mark book because it's, it, I've collected so much, many points on it, so to speak, in that traditional sense. So in, in traditional grading, in that point gathering paradigm, we actually have lost control of the weighting. We think we have control of it, but we lost control of it because we tend to test and over test early concepts. And then those later concepts that are worth a lot are only appearing maybe once on a test. And yes, it's worth seven, but we have other items that have, we had three questions of this type. We had three questions of uh, multiplying two digit numbers on every quiz and the final test. And like it's now, the sum total of that outcome is now worth 18 points, right? Like it just, we've lost control of the weighting in that, in that regard. So how do we reinstill weighting in the sense that we want the mark that we put on or the grade that we put on a report card to be reflective of what we think every outcome should be worth. So I do talk about this in the book about how if you're doing outcomes or standard based assessment that before you convert it from data to 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 uh, numbers you can put a weighting down on each outcome. And common weightings for outcomes are, you kind of think of the base being one, and then you can have some outcomes that are worth 0.5 and others that are worth two or three or 1.5. Like you get to put the, whatever the multiplier is on any outcome that you want or any standard that you want. And then in the end, the sum total of what that, out, of what that unit is worth is now you've controlled the weighting. And it doesn't really matter how many data points have gone into any one standard, you're controlling the weighting through that weighting multiplier, right? So it doesn't matter if there's if there's 10 data points in one row and 15 in another because 
you're really only outputting one score for each one of them. And that score is now being multiplied by whatever your multiplier is. Does, is that making sense, Abigail? Or do we need some visuals on that? Like, I think- oh, that's I think, good. Okay. So that's one form of weighting, right? That sort of weighting where we're saying, I want the final grade to be comprised of these standards and not all standards are creating equal, created equal. So I want to weight them out. And that's the beauty of doing standards or outcomes-based assessments. You really can regain control because it doesn't care how many data points there is in any one outcome or standard. Whereas in point gathering system, the more data points there are, or more points in any one outcome or standard, the more it weights it. Um, the other type of weighting is how we weight our evidence. And I think that was subtly asked in that other part of the question. And it kind of goes back to the conversation we were having with Don, which is if Don can do it on a test, should that be worth more than if I corner him at the whiteboard and I say, what does this mean? And he can explain it to me, right? And our tendency is to think that because it's on the test that somehow it should be worth more, that it should be weighted more. But think about this. Don knew that test was coming up. We did a whole bunch of review. He got able, was able to study for it. He knew the date and time that that was gonna happen. But I corner him at the whiteboard and I say, what does this mean? He can explain it. Like that should actually be worth more in a way than what he performed on a test when he knew it was coming and he knew the types of questions that were coming. So, so it's about how do, we, how do we weight our evidence in our own psychology when we're sitting there looking at the evidence, looking at the data and deciding what, does, what story does this data tell? And in my opinion, a student who can re spontaneously respond to a question that they didn't know was coming is actually a much stronger source of evidence than, than on something that they knew was coming and they had time to prepare for. But you're going to have to wrestle with this psychology. Like our psychology is so heavily skewed towards the power, the importance, the, the weight of tests. And, and sometimes we, we make them even weightier by calling them exams. And then, you know, like, like, and then we call them final exams to make them really heavy and really important. But ultimately, is that really evidence? Because if it was, wouldn't we be having, wouldn't we be a lot further ahead in math education these days? Because how many, how many times have you, have you faced in the first week of school students who seem to know nothing from the previous year, even when you were the teacher last year? And, and yet they did fine on the, on the final exam, right? So it's, it's, there is that type of weighting, which I call psychological weighting, which is the degree to which you are willing to accept sources of evidence as equal or not, All right? So some teachers I've worked with will draw a horizontal line through their, their tracking sheet for each outcome and above the line, they put evidence that comes from formal structures like tests and quizzes and below the line, they put evidence that comes from informal structures like observations and conversations. And then, and then they have that separation in the data so that when they sit down, to make that determination of, of, of what story is this data telling, they have a clearer picture of where the sources of data come from. But like I said, in my opinion, a student who can spontaneously answer a question is actually, that should be a heavier weighting than, than on a test. Does that help? Am I, yeah? Yeah, thank you for expanding on that. Cause I think, it totally makes sense. Just it's so foreign, like you were saying, the like psychological weeding that we have ingrained in us, right? So yeah, and we can't get away from that, right? Like there is this psychology that, like there was a I wrote a paper years ago on the four purposes of assessment, and three of them made it into the book, right? The formative, the summative, and then the evaluate what you value. But there was a fourth one, which I call the anti-purpose, and that is that assessment should not. Oops, I'm speaking. Canadian here when I talk about assessment and marks and and things like that when grading which seems to be the preferred term in uh in the U.S. should never be used for ranking purposes right and and yet and if you look at your assessment mandate 
it will it, it often clearly says that assessment and grading is not for ranking, right? Like like you are your goal or your job as a teacher is to produce a grade that is the most reflective of what the student has learned. If then other bodies want to use that information for ranking purposes, that's up to them, right? University admission, honor roll, awards, scholarships, whatever. They can do that, but our job as teachers is not to rank. And yet, there is this cultural hangover around ranking that exists, that, that goes back till the time of the IQ test. And that's when it started. The IQ test, when, you know, coming out of Switzerland, that this idea that we could put a number to a person and then that number will, 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 be reflective of their worth, of their potential, of their capability. But in order for that to have validity, then we have to have tremendous, tremendous control of the testing environment. And there was born this idea of synchronicity and fairness, and that everyone is writing at the same time and there's no opportunities to collaborate or communicate. And all of this has led into this psychosis of, of that that is a hangover from ranking. And there are still cultures in the world that rank their students and they, they, you're told which quartile you're in and, and things like that. And, but, and, and report cards that don't just have a grade, 88%, and then it says three of 34, right? Like it's, there are places in the world that, that do this, but we don't do that in Canada. I have yet to see a place in the US that does that. Um, and yet, that that's ingrained in us at a level that we just can't understand because when ranking matters all of these other things matter and keep in mind that the the most tightly controlled assessment in the world is the SAT and it has it has one standard deviation of 30 points right even so tightly controlled they can only say with 19 time, with 95% certainty that the score you've been given falls within a range of plus or minus 60 points 95% of the time. All right, I think um, we have uh, one more topic on the list. Um, and uh, Dana, if you wanna go ahead and talk about that. Yeah, another topic that I've seen come up um, in the Facebook page and also often in our book study Zoom meetings is how we address students who have been absent. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I get in this question a lot. And I think, I think the reason we're getting this question a lot is because teachers, so this is what happens, right? So in a traditional setting, a student is absent. And they come in and we say, they say, what I miss, right? In the best case, they come to you and say, what did I miss? And you say, well, we did section 7.1 and 7.2 of the textbook. Here are some notes. Here's a couple of questions for you to do. Come and see me at lunch if you need any help, right? And we kind of, this is how we've always managed it. And we felt okay with that, right? And, and we felt okay. And, and then we start teaching in a thinking classroom setting and the student comes in and says, what did I miss? And you start to realize all of a sudden that, wow, you missed a lot. And you missed a lot of stuff that can't be captured by reading section 7.1 and 7.2 in the notes or doing those questions. These things that you missed are, I can't reproduce for you. I can't just, and then we feel bad. And this is this is where we're at and you're nodding a lot. So I think you're feeling this too. And I think this is a testament to the fact that teachers are waking up to the fact that what happens in a thinking classroom is irreproducible through, through the textbook and the notes, right? And so, so I have this, so let, let's get into the model of what's really going on. So in the traditional setting where we said, well, you missed section 7.1 and 7.2, here's some, read those sections, here's some notes, here's some questions, come see me if you need help. Their experience of doing that is actually not really that different from what they would have experienced in the classroom. And the reason that hasn't bothered us is because the gap isn't so big, right? 
Now I have this saying, if your lesson can be replaced by four pages of paper, it should be, right? What that means is you haven't added value to, that, to, to the student being present. It wasn't that big a difference. What happens in a thinking classroom setting is the difference is huge, right? The student comes in and says, what I miss, he said, well, we did section 7.1 and 7, and there's your spiel. And you recognize right away that that's where they are, but that's what they would have gotten if they were present. And because that gap is so big, we feel like, we feel horrible about that. We feel that what we've done to compensate for that is insufficient. Guess what? The gap is supposed to be big. Not for punitive reasons. It means you've added value. And the bigger the gap is, the more value has been added to the lesson, right? That's our job as teachers is to add value to the content. And if, if we're not adding value, then the difference isn't big. But if we are adding value, then the difference will be huge. So if you're feeling bad about it, it means you've added a lot of value. There's been value added by being present. Now, and good job, you should pat yourself on the back because and the bigger this gap is, the more value you have added to being present. And the more you need to be, that needs to be acknowledged by you and the people around you, well done. It doesn't make us feel less bad, right? But what can we do, right? Like really, what can we do? There's, there's well, the one thing that we can do is we stand back and notice that oftentimes in thinking classrooms, there's less absences and less lates because the students are themselves starting to recognize that being absent is a bigger loss than being present, right? Um, one teacher I work with always says to her students if they're absent, come see me at lunch, bring two friends. And then she puts them as a group of three at the board and gets them going and she gives them questions as they need to. And that is, reproduces some of that experience, right? Um, I was in a classroom where two things happened. One was we had torn through a ton of content on day one. And then day two, there were two students who hadn't been present on day one. And <clears throat> so I just went up to one of the groups and I said, okay, listen, Adam wasn't here to yesterday. So for the first three questions, you need to go really slow. And Adam's gonna hold the marker and you gotta get him caught up. And they did. And by halfway through the lesson, he was even with everybody else. And that's, that kids are amazing that way. In another lesson, we were 30 minutes into solving one and two step equations and a student walked in late. And I plugged them into a group and I handed him the marker and I told the two girls that were there, I said, listen, I know you're on this question, but I'm gonna back you up to these four questions help him through these and then and then pick another one on the journey and then take him to this question and, and see where we're at and then I kept checking in I said how they how you doing are they good teachers and they're like, oh yeah they're great teachers I'm right there right and it's we can make use of that but that only works if absences are intermittent if a student misses a whole week or it's pervasive where they're present for a lesson and then absent for two. And this is obviously there's some other ongoing crisis that's going on. It doesn't solve that problem. And then we just have to do what we can and say, these are the sections that you missed. This is some questions. Come and see me if you need help. Like that's all we can do. Right. And we're going to feel lousy about it. And I can't do anything about that. But if you're feeling lousy, it probably means that you've added a lot of value. And maybe that'll make you feel less lousy. Yeah, that that was actually very reassuring because um, I, I mean, as teachers, you know, we want the best for our kids, and so you, when when they do miss, they they come in. What I miss? Well, um, can't even begin to tell you what you missed. <laughs> you yeah. know, so yeah, and I and I've done a few of those things, and I'm sure a lot of others have as well. But um, it's given me some thoughts to expand on on what I've already tried for my because I, I do have come from a school where we have a lot of absences yeah so and we do what we can so I've worked with teachers who try to keep everything very modular so it's self-contained so let's say that today's lesson or whatever it is we're backing up four lessons and we're going to just thin slice very quickly through 
sort of this review phase before we get into the new content. And that sort of built in spiraling <clears throat> doesn't eat in, into a lot of time, but what it does is it turns out to be really healthy for everybody. Students who are absent and students who are present. They just have an opportunity to just keep th seeing things over and over again. And <clears throat> that sort of built in spiraling compensates a lot for, for absences. But again, nothing should replace an experience in a face-to-face -face setting with a teacher, whether they're using thinking classrooms or not, nothing should replace it, right? And um, there's this journal and once a year they put out an issue called the history of the future, no, the, yeah, the history of the future of education. And <clears throat> one of the things that can be said about every education prediction in the last century is that the, every one of them has been wrong. And one of the main reasons every one of them has been wrong is because there's been this pervasive assumption that with advanced technology, we can replace the teacher. And we can't. The teacher is irreplaceable. The teacher is what adds value to content. And, and I think that is more true now than it has ever been. And I think it's more true in a thinking classroom. I think it's more true anytime a teacher steps out and starts doing anything progressive. The teacher is irreplaceable. No technology is going to replace a teacher, which means that you add value. And being absent, you lose that value. All you're left with is that hollow husk of math. All the learning, the engagement, the meaning making, the productive struggle, all of that was missed. Thank you so much. Um, Don, I think we're going to you next. Okay, um, one, other, one other thing that's come up um, in, it comes up in the, in the group and it's come up apparently in the, in the chat as well. And, and that's about, um, that's about special education and accommodations. You know, we, we all have a number of students who have various accommodations, um, whether it's preferential seating, um, you know, note-taking uh, accommodations. Um, how does, and some of those seem kind of weird in a thinking classroom, you know, preferential seating, like, well, you know, where is that even, right? And um, so what, what can you speak to, to accommodations for, for special ed? Yeah. So, so first of all, the language on this, accommodations and adaptation language is, is kind of confusing depending on where you go. So let's just get some terminology straight here. <clears throat> so in my world, where I live and breathe and, and my kids went to school, an accommodation is minor and will allow the student to get credit for the course. Whereas an adaptation is major and the student actually doesn't get credit for the course. So let's just stay with accommodations as being things that are minor. Uh, and minor, like they can be huge, but they're still, Fundamentally, the student is learning the content. Maybe not all of it, but enough of it to say that they have credit for the course. Um, and then, so we have these students and the students who need accommodations come from a whole bunch of different sources, right? They could be students who have been diagnosed with some sort of situation that they're living with. They could be on the spectrum, they could have ADHD, they could be living with Down syndrome. Right? They could have a diagnosed anxiety disorder, uh, some sort of oppositional um, complication. Um, there could be all of these sorts of things. And then you can also have sort of, and, and those often lead to then an IEP. And I think an IEP is pretty universally understood in North America, but it stands for, if someone's coming from elsewhere, it stands for, for an individual educational plan, which has been written um, in concert between often educators, psychologists, uh, people who are actually tasked with providing the accommodations and the resources for students in the school. So there's this IEP that's been written that makes the recommendations of what sorts of accommodations students need in the classroom. And I've seen a lot of accommodations over the years and or at least the executive summaries for accommodations. And one of the things I can generally say is that accommod uh, IEPs are almost always written on the assumption that the classroom is a traditional classroom. Right. So this student needs to sit at the front. OK, what does that mean in a thinking classroom? This student needs to have a scribe 
to write their notes for them. Okay, How, what does that mean in a setting where we're actually note making? And oh, by the way, I already put notes online, right? Like, like a lot of these uh, accommodations sort of fall away when we move into classrooms that are non-traditional. And it doesn't have to be a thinking classroom. It just has to be any sort of a non-traditional setting. And all of a sudden, this accommodation doesn't make sense anymore. So a lot of things are just taken away uh, simply by the fact that we're already, this classroom already accommodates for that. Right. So here's here's one of my favorite. The student with ADHD who has an accommodation that says a student needs to be able to stand up and 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 move around a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Well, guess what? <laughs> they they have to do that. <laughs> so so again, a lot of these things just sort of fade away. Um, does that mean that our students don't need accommodations? Absolutely not. Of course, they're going to need accommodations. Um, but it's not always the students who you have an IEP for. Because you know that, that, that girl who sits in the third desk in the second row? She's, she's at, in a traditional setting. She has an undiagnosed anxiety disorder. Except nobody knows that. Maybe she doesn't even know that. She, because she's, uh, she's never been tested. And she's never been pushed. Because in, in a traditional setting, she can just disappear. She can just be quiet and not put up her hand and do her work. And, and she doesn't have to be on the spot and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden you flip this to a thinking classroom and all of us, this girl is starting to look a little uncomfortable. And you're realizing that, okay, there's something going on here that nobody knew about. Meanwhile, we got another one where we got the IEP and I knew about that and this student's fine. I don't even have to pay attention to what's going on over there because that student is thriving in this environment. So the first thing I always say when this question comes up is your students are gonna need accommodations. It's just not always the students that you expect, right? It's, you're just gonna have to read the room because, because what is recommended as accommodations in a traditional setting are not gonna map necessarily to what happens in a thinking classroom. So you have to be nimble and you have to be able to react. And that, but that is good teaching is to be able to look at a situation and recognize that, wow, this student who has never had an IEP, requires no resources, has been getting high marks in my course or in all their courses previously. And now all of a sudden they are really in need of some, some support because this is a high risk environment for them. They have a lot to lose and they realize that they don't actually know what to do in this setting. And you're gonna to have to support them in that journey. Um, so there's a couple of things that, in the answer to your main question, which was, what do we do when we say that a student, an IEP says a student needs preferential treatment? You just say, okay, I'm on it. And when it says that they need to have a scribe, you just say, yeah, we're on it because you are, you're on it, right? But if it says something that is a little bit more specific, then you may have to actually negotiate with some of the people who wrote it and say, you know what, that's not, that's actually not going to be helpful here. Um, <clears throat> so I'll give you an example. There was a, uh, I was working with a teacher we had a student who had a cochlear implant. And the, uh, the accommodation was that this student needs to be able to work in a quiet setting because with a cochlear implant, the, the noise of the classroom can be overstimulating. And I thought, I, I get that, right? And, I, and totally. And so her accommodation was that she put uh, a, a whiteboard on a door and then had the door open into an office that was off of the classroom so that this student could stand with their group of two so that they were just somewhat removed from all the noise in the classroom. There was, they were, they were sort of halfway into this office and was a little bit quieter. And, and that was a good accommodation and that worked well and kept the student uh, engaged and it, it, it dimmed some of that chaos that was going on. But apparently the school counselor and, and the parents didn't think that that was a sufficient accommodation. So their recommendation was that this student was then going to do the rest of the school year in what was called the resource room. And which is sort of a, 
a support space. And this teacher was now tasked with having to create individual lesson plans for this student, for the, for the people who were going to work with this student. And that student was going to be absent out of this class for the rest of the school year. Well, the first day that that was supposed to happen, the student showed up in her classroom. And she's like, oh, I thought you were, I've already sent, the, I've taken down the whiteboard from the door and the student says, it's fine. I'd rather be here. And that student stayed in that class for the rest of the year didn't need any adaptations or accommodations um, because the counselors and the parents were over advocating above and beyond what the student actually wanted. So I think we just have to like good teaching is always good teaching, which is you have to be in the moment, you have to be responsive to the, the crises that are happening in front of you and you have to be able to adapt and accommodate and, and, and zig when students zag and provide them with the support that's necessary for them to be successful. Sometimes IEPs give us a heads up, right? So one of them is, one of the big ones that we face all the time, and this is for students who, who have live with Asperger's, autism, Down syndrome, sometimes ADHD. Um, they are, they have an IEP that says that the student needs consistency, consistency, consistency. Um, but when you read the psychological literature on this, the psychological literature doesn't actually say consistency, it says predictability. Consistency is just one of the easy ways to create predictability. How else can we create predictability? Well, we, we talk to the student, we let them know what's coming at their way. And we may say, okay, so this will always be your card, this will always be your desk, this will always be your whiteboard, where you're gonna get two new partners every day. And they're gonna come to you. That's predictable. The student knows where to sit, where to stand, and that they're going to get two new partners every day. That's predictable, right? And almost 100% of the time that we've done that accommodation for a student, within three weeks, they're coming and saying, I want to pick my own card, because that's now predictable for them, right? They know that the card will tell them where they sit and where they stand, and they will need two new partners every day. So it's just about this idea of recognizing that. Um, all our students need, need our help and our support at different stages. And what are the best ways to do that? And IEPs give us a heads up on some of the things that might help us in that journey, but not always. Um, well, thank you, Peter. It's, um, you know, we've um, gone well over an hour. Um, and so unless you have any, you know, if you have any other comments you'd like to make, um, you know, I, I, we're so grateful for, for the time that you've given, um, you know, we can wrap up. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's really, really important about thinking classrooms, and, you know, I've, I can't follow it on Facebook because I drown in there, but I do try to follow it on Twitter. And there are some things that pop up, especially this time of the year all the time, that is, this I, there's two things I want to comment on. One is this idea that I need to get funding to make my turn my class into a thinking classroom. Of course, funding is great, but it does. We never found a classroom we couldn't hack for less than fifty dollars, right? Like for less than fifty dollars, we'll make use of the furniture that's in the space. We'll put up something on the boards on the walls that kids can write on that can be erased. Cellophane, white books, whatever it is, we'll just we'll hack it and get it going. And it's it's just a lot easier to get funding uh, from your administration. If you can bring them into a space and say, this is what I'm doing, just think how much better it would be if I have whiteboard, whiteboards, right? But, but if we wait for the system to give us the resources necessary to do this in a perfect way, we will we'll be waiting a long time. And I've worked in settings where all of a sudden they've come in and said, we're going, we're going thinking classrooms in all our classrooms, we're buying you all whiteboards and everyone's yay. And the whiteboards are there. They're there at the end of July. It takes six months to install them all, right? So it's like, we can't wait for the system. We just have to hack our way through to get it going. Um, and in fact, sometimes it's, it's more exciting when there's a little bit of variance within the room and kids cheer when they get to work on the window or the side of the file cabinet, or they get to write on that desk that's standing up on end because that's exciting, right? It's, it's these sorts of things that, that kind of is valuable to keep in mind. The second thing that's really important to understand 
is that chapter 15 of the book is about this, the sequence to implement in, and it came out of research. But what it really means is that thinking classrooms is developmental, right? It's developmental. It's developmental for you as a teacher and it's developmental for the students as learners. We can't do all 14 at once. And even if we could, the kids couldn't handle it. So it's like, the research has shown we start with three practices. Start with three practices, right? Just start. Don't worry about grading yet. Just start. And don't worry about consolidation yet. Just start, right? And, and, and that is going to grow you as a teacher. But not only that, you're going to make a change and the kids are going to respond. And that's going to make it easier for you to do the next change because the kids have grown and now they're thinking and they're, they got some perseverance and they're patient and, they're, and there's some empathy has been unlocked and they stopped asking you a million questions a day. And now it's a lot easier for you to start thinking about how am I going to avoid answering questions or how am I going to think about how I give the task? How am I gonna start planning for consolidation, which is impossible to do if I'm getting 60 questions an hour, right? So it's, it's, it's developmental. And then we can take the next step and then the kids grow with you. And then they become all of a sudden more responsible and autonomous. And that's just going to make it so much easier for me to maintain flow. And then it's going to make it so much easier for me to start layering in the assessment and so on and so forth. Be patient with yourself and be patient with your students. It's developmental, right? Yes, it'd be nice if we could do all these 14 practices at once. But give yourself permission to learn and grow and become better and start and then go further. And I think that's I think that's the big thing to, you know, like you can still do homework the way you're normally doing it. You can still run tests and quizzes and you can still be a point gatherer until you get to that stage where you're ready to change that. And I think I think that was a really uh, thank you for that, you know, uh, just saying that a really valuable thing, particularly at the stage that our group is in. You know, we've had just unbelievable growth and we have a lot of people that joined this summer who've never done it before, just read the book. And, you know, there's a lot of concern about, you know, how do I do it? Where do I start? And, you know, I, I think you're just jump in and start slowly and do the first three and then, you know, go from there when you're ready is, is really valuable. Yeah, it is, you know. All right. All right. Well, Thanks thank for you. hosting this again. Much. Oh, sure. We'll do this anytime you would like to. So um, I, I, I don't think we have any complaints from, from people um, you know, listening to you speak. All right. Well, again, thank you very much, Peter, for your time. And um, we look forward to talking to you again at some point. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. And thanks for tuning in or watching the recording in the future. And good luck with the start of your school year. Thanks.